I'm Tim Herrera with the Sacramento County Office of Education here with another Teacher of the Year profile. We're speaking with Vanessa Leiby, who is one of two Teachers of the Year for the San Juan Unified School District. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. So tell us about yourself. Tell us your school and, and what you teach. I teach 7th and 8th grade English at Sierra Oaks K-8 in Sacramento. Um, and I also do the yearbook elective there. Okay. So um, English language arts, literature, things. What, what are what are seventh and eighth grade students reading these days? Um, they it varies greatly, and we just had a we just underwent a huge adoption in our district, and so we've adopted a program called Amplify, and it's a ninety nine percent online program. And so this year, seventh graders will be looking at um, some Shakespeare, some Poe, um, and assorted poems and nonfiction. Eighth graders will be looking at um, the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, at uh, I think some more Shakespeare. Um, so we're kind of a balance of, of fiction and nonfiction titles. It might be easier to get a seventh or eighth grader interested in Poe because of kind of the mysterious yes. dark content. Yes. But what about Shakespeare? How do, how do you make that relatable to a, to a young teenager? So Shakespeare um, is it's about the, getting them through the language, not to stumble over language, to understand more, to think about what's actually happening um, and to read those stage directions to get an understanding of what's happening instead of trying to stumble over what the words or how to pronounce it are. And a lot of Shakespeare stories, once you have that understanding, um, the kids are just automatically engaged in them because there's just, again, very much like Poe, that content is very interesting to a middle schooler. <laughs> <laughs> Once they learn how to decode, mm -hmm. basically, the language, they, they're able to easier follow the story. Yes. So what's it like when you see a young person really kind of getting into Shakespeare? Um, this year when we did it, that was actually when they came in and had done my observation. The kids are fighting over who gets to be a character, like who gets to read for which character. They're changing their voices in order to read that character the way that they've learned that, the way that they are. Um, they want, look forward to it every day. They come in and they actually take out their books and they're like, okay, we're, what act are we starting on? What are we going to do? And then this year we were actually very fortunate to go, we did Midsummer Night's Dream, so then we went to the Sacramento Theater Company production of Midsummer Night's Dream, so they actually got to see it brought to life. They're like, that's not how we pictured it was, but it was fun for them to do that comparison. So, so when, you're, when you're working with these young people, you know, you, how do you instill in them good, good uh, reading habits and good writing habits? So to, I, to lay a foundation for what they need when they're older. Um, for me, I, my, my personal passion for writing and reading, um, through the Area 3 Writing pro, Area Three writing Project, I'm a teacher consultant for them, and so that, that passion of writing and having the kids just write with copious amounts without even realizing that they're actually writing, um, that's that. And then reading, we do a big independent reading program. I stress that. That's their only homework in my class is your self-selected independent choice reading. And we do conferences and talk about all of that and why it's going to be important. I have kids come in from high school and talk to the kids about how the things that we did in seventh and eighth grade English have helped them now that they're in high school and then in college as well. Okay, so you mentioned the Area 3 Writing Project. Yes. Kind of go into detail uh, of what that is for people who don't know. So it's an um, outcropping of the National Writing Project. It's a um, two-week intensive uh, writing institute. You apply, you get accepted, you go through everything. It's a life-changing a life changing experience. It's very hard to explain it, um, but you just rediscover that whole passion for writing and how kids write and why writing is important. And then through that, you then get to use those connections and what you've learned to set up things for your school and for your students and um, and to further that love of writing to get that importance out there. So is it kind of like a boot camp for ELA teachers? It's not really a boot camp because it's rewarding. <laughs> I don't know, I guess boot camp could be rewarding, sure. I'm not sure, but uh -huh. it is, it, and it doesn't seem like it. I mean, when you're doing it, it's just writing. It's actually having time to sit down and do your own writing, which when you're a teacher, you often are so involved in grading all these other pieces of writing, you don't think about it your own self. So it makes you realize again, why is it that you do what you do? Okay, well then how do we now get the kids to realize how, why they're doing what they're doing to help them then give you the product that needs to be given? Trying to make it all relatable to exactly. everybody. Exactly. So how long have you been teaching? Uh, this starting here in two weeks, it'll be my 16th year and it'll be my ninth year at my current school, all in San Juan. Oh, okay. So, so what kind of changes have you seen uh, as a teacher just in that span of time? 
Um, I've seen a lot more diversity come into classrooms. Um, I've seen a lot of uh, structural changes in schools, like setups, uh, grade level setups. We have you know, some K-12s, you have 6-12s, you have K-8s, there's 6-8s, there's 7-8s, there's K-5s. Um, and I just see a lot of, um, especially in San Juan, a lot of movement into those 21st century skills, a lot more technology, a lot more bringing in the importance of being technologically literate and, um, and using all of those tools like the Chromebooks and finding that importance on Apple TVs and all of those things. Uh, real incorporation of technology mm -hmm. into what you do. So how important with those changes over the years is the professional development that you get? Huge. Uh, yeah. Professional development is huge. I mean, for me, um, I am a lifelong learner. I think it's important to be constantly in the know of what's going on and constantly finding new ways. I mean, you might go to a training and it may not benefit you, but when you find like that one thing that now it's just transforms what you're doing, it makes it worth it. Just like with kids, you're expecting them to learn all of these things year after year, but if you don't change with the times, then they're not going to learn what needs to be learned. And so while Shakespeare is never going to change, maybe some ways that you present or whatever will change yeah. after what you've the learned. The ways you do it, which plays you choose, mm -hmm. um, which adaption you use or which version you use, it changes depending from year to year, class to class. I mean, that's the great thing about my school district. We're a teacher choice district. So even though we do have, you know, those adopted um, curriculums, teachers can still pull in the bits and pieces that they know work or that they find work extremely well to supplement whatever they're working with. What's your biggest challenge? Biggest challenge, I think, would be um, discipline, like at a school level. I think discipline um, as it gets in, in the kids that are super high flyer behaviors that are disrupting the learning of everyone else. Is how do we re-engage them or pull them in so that those behaviors don't don't uh, escalate even further or disrupt the learning environment? That and also um, teacher collaboration. I think you, teaching is already so segregating and I think it's really hard to find those opportunities for teachers to be able to work together and actually collaborate and plan things. And so I'm super fortunate in San Juan to be part of a great tribe of, of uh, educators in the English program. Um, Nicole Kukral, is, uh, she does a good job of leading us and, and bringing us all together to expand our ELA knowledge and just really be the best that we can be. So. It's exciting. <laughs> because you really have to work as a team. Yes. And sometimes you do get stuck in your own, you know, your own bubble, your own area and focused exactly. on what you need and without really realizing what everybody else needs as well. Right. Especially working at a K-8. So I'm the seventh and eighth grade English teacher. There's one other teacher that'll take either one seventh or one eighth, whatever the overflow is. And then that's our English department. So it really is very solo unless you have great people to work with. So what motivated you to be a teacher in the first place? Um, it was actually my high school math teacher, my high school pre-algebra math teacher, because I am very strong in English and that is like my thing, but math has always been super difficult. And um, at that same time in high school, I was going through some kind of family issues and just not um, thinking that by failing all my classes, I could like, get back at the world. And so he actually pulled me aside and he said, you know, we need to work through these things. We need to work through not only your academic, but we need to work through your social. And this isn't hurting anybody but you. You're going to come in every day for one hour after school. We're going to work you through this. We're going to get you to pass. And so he did. He got me to pass geometry by the end of my senior year. So I was able to graduate. And just that relationship that he took the time to build just really set, settled in me and made me really want to do that for others and to help kids really discover how to learn and why it's important to learn. And and be there to help them, guide them through that. And you try to carry that over into your practice with yes, your students. definitely, yeah. yes. Well, what's it feel like to be a teacher of the year? It's pretty amazing. It's, I'm very humble, I think, and so I, I often forget to bring that up. We were, had a training this summer, and they're like, say one great thing that's happened to you, and I was like, I don't know what's great, and then, you know, hoping, like, what do you mean you don't know what's great? You're the teacher of the year. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm the teacher of the year. <laughs> and it's just fun to then be able to, through this whole process of reflecting on it, to go back and acknowledge all of those people that have been like part of, that own part of this award because I've learned so much from them and I've worked with them and they've just shaped a lot of my pedagogy and a lot of my way of teaching. And so I share it with so many people and it's just great to be able to have this, this 
spot of influence and to be recognized. I mean, it's always great to be recognized. Yeah, for sure. Well, congratulations <laughs> to you. Thank you so much. We've been speaking with Vanessa Leiby, who is one of two Teachers of the Year for the San Juan Unified School District. Thank you so much.